Football made simple. Become great at your craft by finding ways to make it simple for those around you. This is the Coaching 101 Podcast, hosted by Find A Way Productions. With your co-host, Daniel Chamberlain and Kenny Simpson. Welcome back, coaches. This is Coaching 101 Podcast with your co-host, Kenny Simpson and Daniel Chamberlain. How's it going, coach? It's going well, man. I'm, I'm excited to get on here. It looks like you finished up your dinner in about a record time of two minutes. We're <laughs> ready to go now. Smashing through some fajitas, man. That, yeah, I had to. Um, sometimes I push myself to the limit on time. Tonight was one of those. Been working in the garden because it was a beautiful day, and I uh, got to get the garden started. So that's what it took, just slamming, slamming dinner. Yep. Um, I tell you what, man, it, the weather outside is perfect for spring ball. And I know that high schools are just getting into that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the colleges are finished watching a ton of spring games. Got to watch the Sooners play this weekend. Wearing the Sooners shirt tonight. If you're watching on YouTube, you see that. But, uh, I guess y'all are kind of Razorback fans over there, huh? Well, I'm not from Arkansas. Of course, I, I'm a I'm big fan of, uh, what they're doing with the Razorbacks now. A new coach has been doing a great job with them, but. Anyway, I know you know spring ball's over because my phone's been blowing up with all these colleges now. All the D2s are done, so now they're going to come recruit. Right. So they've been on our campuses, which I, I think that's a credit. You know, I don't know where, what part of the country people are listening to this from, but Arkansas does a really good job. The D2s out here do a really good job of recruiting in the state, and it's been cool. So our spring ball's starting at about – probably about uh, – Probably about two weeks, we'll really get into it, and then we're only going to go about two weeks. But we're going to do something pretty cool. Um, so I, I'm partnered with Reps. I don't know if you know, they do the VR kind of digital kind of stuff. So one of our practice days will be a full RPO day. And we're going to put that little 360 camera on the helmet of the quarterback and go through every scenario of RPOs. And I figure, man, what better way for them to learn it than for us to do it that way? And then I'll have – then on the back end of that, I'll have something to give all my quarterbacks in the future of how to read RPOs. So that's going to be kind of cool, new new for us. So they're going to record you doing it now to be your playback at a later time? Is that right? Yeah, so, so basically what we'll do is we'll set it up. Uh, they basically mount this GoPro that films like a 360-degree angle, which I've never seen that before. And I'm old, so technology's beyond me. But, you know, we're going to go through like, uh, let's say we're going to pick one RPO we run. So we run a, an RPO we call peak where we're like a glance route pretty much. So we'll run through that scenario three times and we'll direct the read to do the different things he might do, you know, in a game. So we'll hit that same exact RPO three times. And then what you do is you put the, the, the company builds out like a quiz. So I could put it on my fifth grade quarterback, sixth grade quarterback, seventh grade quarterback, and he sees what we see, and then he has a key word he has to say, like, am I am I giving it or am I throwing it? You know, and so he says that, I kind of quiz him on it. So a really, really cool product, and uh, I'm excited to try it out. You know, I think our kids are going to really enjoy going through that. And what I've learned is when you do different things in the spring, when the kids really tend to retain that information a lot better. Yeah, and I'm sure anything is more fun than just more practices. So Correct. Coaches, I'm ready to go out there and just have practice. Like I'm, I'm in, I'm ready. Kids are probably like, uh, I've been in sports this whole time, right? I don't need another practice right now. So right. it's cool that you're making it fun doing something with, with technology. Yeah. We're excited about it. I was excited. And I've got a couple plans coming up. Um, you know, we're, I know I've, I've got Iowa coming up later this summer. I'm excited about that. And then one of the things we're doing with our kids, we're actually taking them to St. Louis, putting on the first ever gun tee, team camp oakville high school so they'd host us they'd put our team up and so we're going to bring our own kids down there with their kids who are running the gun tee there's a couple other schools coming in and so uh, ho- hopefully going to get to go watch a cardinal game one night and have a good time with the kids competing you know interstate kids kind of competing and then coaches get together and share ideas so got a lot of really cool things coming up and football season is definitely you mentioned the weather football season's right around the corner it's coming Went from freezing to like 85 here, and then we had some tornadoes, and now things have settled down to a real spring. So right, that's right. been pretty good. Well, before we move on, Coach, why don't you tell us some ways that we can simplify our coaching for our staff and kids? Sure. The Coaching 101 podcast is sponsored by Find Away Productions. 
Final Way Productions has three major uh, components, OffensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com, all things offense. Uh, you want to go for the full academy or get the workbook or get smaller digital products. There's all kinds of information there in single courses as well. DefensiveCoordinatorAcademy.com, the same thing, but on the defensive side of the ball. So it's got a full academy. It's got a workbook, a brand new defensive line academy that's coming out. Uh, if it's not already out, uh, we're really excited about. So there's a lot of components that are inside of that. You want to learn defensive football, go over to defensivecoordinatoracademy.com. Finally, fbcoachsimpson.com, which is the home to Headsets Magazine, which is free. It's also the host to multiple other things, including the Gun T System, the 3 4 Swarm, as well as 29 now. Added another book, so 29 uh, coaching resources or books and about 50 PowerPoints or coaching documents coaches can use to help them become better at what they do. We had uh, Bo Gould on a couple weeks ago, which was really last weekend, but that's this is podcasting, right? So um, I think it was two weeks ago when that episode came out. And is that is that the 29th book? Uh, no, he book? was like the 27th. So we've got oh. a youth one that's come out since then, but his book was awesome. Man, you're writing them faster than I can keep track, and I'm here well, for I, it. So. I started learning uh, guys like Bo Gould, and then my defensive line coach at Cersei has now helped me kind of co-author some books. And so that's enabled us to produce them quicker. And also uh, some of these really talented coaches are getting a chance to show the world what they can do. That's awesome. Well, we'll move on pretty quick. Um, so tonight's episode is all about opponent breakdown. Um I think we're going to keep it pretty general tonight, talking about head coaching duties and and kind of what you would do from that role less. I mean, we will talk your what your staff is doing for you as well. But if you're looking for the offensive or defensive breakdown specifically here, that'll just have to be later in the uh, year. We don't even have that one fully scheduled yet. But tonight we want to get a general look at what all that looks like. Um, so right off the bat, Coach, let's just talk about what your opponent breakdown looks like. Sure. Uh, you know, and I'm going to go at, like you mentioned, go at this kind of from a head coach. So uh, obviously, if you're on one side of the ball, it's more scheme specific. Uh, as a head coach, I kind of look at it as, and I've mentioned this a couple of times on this podcast before, but it's been a, a very easy visual for me to get. And I'm hoping guys that are listening may get it as well. You kind of have to think of a, of a funnel. And so the idea of a head coach is you've got so much information you have to gather so you're, you know, you're looking at, I'm, I'm just going to start on, let's say we, we just finished the game on Friday. All right, we got a game coming up. So before I can even break down an opponent, I've got to reevaluate what we're doing. So I've got to go through and what injuries do we have and what kid's not playing well and why are they not playing well? What kid is playing well and needs more playing time? So you got to go through all that stuff as a head coach before you can even get to opponent breakdown. But then when you do go, to opponent breakdown, you've got to start looking at not just scheme, you know, not just what plays are they running, but you've got to look at, okay, you know, how have we handled this game in the past? You know, are our kids intimidated by this game? Are we overlooking this opponent? So there's all of that kind of stuff going on. Then you have to look at, okay, I'm in charge as a head coach. I'm responsible for offense, defense, and special teams. So there's a massive amount of information there. And we're going to talk a little bit about delegating here in the next section of this podcast, but you know, you still ultimately you're responsible for all of that stuff. And so is this this massive amount of information that has to get done that you're responsible for. And so you have to figure out somewhere in that funnel as it gets smaller, what information am I going to entrust to certain people? You know, what coaches am I going to entrust with uh, breaking down the offense, breaking down the defense, breaking down special teams? What coach am I going to entrust with breaking down our own film, like ODK in the film and all that Stuff that has to happen. What coach am I going to trust with building the practice schedule? Or is that going to be me? And a lot of times as a head coach, what, what we do is we don't have a plan for who does what. And when you don't have a plan for who does what, guess who does it? You do it. Because that's <laughs> kind of, you did that to yourself. As a head coach, we get mad. Our assistants are lazy and whatever, whatever. We always say that kind of stuff. I don't know if y'all know that as assistants, but that's what we say to each other. But the reality is, we did a horrible job of giving you defined roles and delegating you. And so you're as an assistant coach are going, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to do something that coach doesn't want done, but I, you know, I don't want to do nothing. 
And so as a, as a head coach, you have to figure out how that funnel is going to work for you. What coach kind of comes into this part? What coach kind of comes into that part? Um, you got a couple other things you got to look at as well uh, when you talk about watching a, watching a team. So for me, when I'm actually watching the actual opponent, so I've gone through the funnel part now, we've kind of got our roles hopefully defined, and that can be whatever as a coach you want that to look like. I would recommend over-communicate instead of under-communicate what roles you expect guys to do. Like who ODKs the film? Who puts? Do you want the hash marks? Or do you want all those things that you would think common sense you would want done need to be defined and who does them, okay? Then you move on to, okay, now we're actually breaking down the opponent. And here's what I've seen a lot of coaches, myself included, do is we write down every play they've run and we, we get an idea about all their scheme and all their formations and we get a scheme, all this stuff. And we forget that, oh, they have a D1 kid at receiver. Like that needs to be point one. Right. But, you know what? To me, <laughs> we, and I, you, for you, if you've broken enough film, Daniel, you know you've done it. Like as a defense, here's what I hate hearing from defensive coordinators. And I was one. So I can say this, you know, when they say, well, coach, what are you going to do when they put their D1 kid at slot? Are you going to move our best kid to cover? And well, our defense doesn't allow for us to do that. Well, then your defense sucks. Like that, that's the number one thing you got to do that week is stop that kid. You know, so we always start off, I, I call it, watch it like you're a spectator. Like watch the film, like you and your wife are sitting there together watching it. And you ask her, hey, what do you think? And she said, well, you better stop too. You know, that's the, that needs to be that's done. That's coming from first. the stands on Friday anyway, right? Right, that's what I'm saying. Like stop 28. Thank you. But sometimes the coaches, we're too smart. Like we think we're too smart and we don't recognize the glaringly obvious of, Hey, that kid sucks. Don't guard him, you know, or that kid's really good. Put two guys on. So you need to do that stuff first. And that can be offense, defense, special teams. Like we've gone into games and said, we refuse to kick the ball deep because all three of those guys will look like a boomerang. It'll go deep and come right back. Right. So we're, we're just going to onside kick and pooch kick all night long and give you the ball at the 40 yard line, you know? And so that's, that was our scheme uh, because of what you did. Do we have other schemes we can do? Yeah, of course we do. You know, but we were looking at personnel first. And I think a lot of times coaches sometimes lose the forest for the trees with scheme. And I'm not saying scheme does not matter. I'm simply saying watch their dudes first. And the last thing I'll get on here, Daniel, I know you probably got some comments here too, is don't do too much. You know, whatever side of the ball you're on, Let's start with offense here. Let's say you're on offense. Don't put in seven new plays. Like, then your offense is not very good. I mean, honestly, if you're putting in new plays each week, that means what you had to start off with, you don't have an identity now. You know, what you're doing is not working, and, and so you're just going to throw it out and try something new. That's not a good strategy of coaching. You know, don't put in a 17 new formations that week. You should, if you have a good system, you shouldn't have to put anything in. But if you are going to put something in it, it needs to be maybe one or two wrinkles, maybe a trick play or a gadget formation, something small that, hey, it's a new, it's a new wrinkle, or maybe we're going to present this play, we're going to shift this formation instead of just run it normal. You know, so that kind of stuff. And then defensively, the same thing. Like, don't go into a game plan and go, we're going to just run this exotic defense we've never run before. You know, what do you have within your defense that allows you to tag things? And defensively, I would say stop their best two players, and if they beat you, they're just better than you. Like, whatever you do defensively, however you want to do that, stop their best two guys. If they beat you, they're better than you. And then we always look for keys on defense. Like, what's something we can tell our kid that, hey, if this guy pulls, it's 100% X. Or if this guy does this, it's 90% Y. You know, those are those are real tips that'll help your kids. Telling your 16-year-old kid that there's 71% on third down, they do whatever, is not gonna, he's not gonna retain that. You need to know that as a coach, but the kid does not. So that's kind of my three short, simple ones there. You know, number one, make sure you're able to delegate information in that funnel. Number two, watch things like you're a spectator, stop players. And then finally, number three, don't overcomplicate things for the fact that you have 15 to 18 year old kids or whatever age your coach. I don't care if you got professional football players, don't overcomplicate things for them. Give them two or three nuggets that can help them. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the things you said there really go back to if you're not using a system on offense and defense, right. that's that's your number one mistake. If you're having to install a new play, 
you're probably wrong because you probably should have already been through something similar to it in spring ball in August when you were, you know, going through your camps. Um, if you're needing an inside run and you don't have one and you're having to install inside zone or whatever it is to be your inside run to take advantage of their four foot eight defensive tackle, um, you're probably, that's where you're messed up. <laughs> right. Go out, find a system, get gun T, come over and talk to Joe and I, do something and find a system that lets you have answers to multiple problems. You don't have to use them all in your playbook every year, but it sure helps. Right. Uh, same thing on defense, right? You talked about if my defense doesn't allow me to do this thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's bad. Um, if you've got to just move your dude around to cover their dude, and that's what it takes, and it, you know what, you play 10-on-10 10 10 football the rest of the night, and that's okay, as long as that's not the kid that beats you, right? Um, the flavor of the week is kind of what we call that, like jumping into the new thing we've seen. or It's always big, right? Guys want to put in the play from Saturday. Oh, the Sooners you know, did this awesome reverse double pass, um, you know, whatever. Sure, have a gimmick play. Um, I've been watching Bixby stuff the last week or so. I bought the, the OCs thing on yeah. – Throw deep publishing, right? I think that's where they put it. Um, man, talk about it's everything you just said is in that exact presentation. It's what do you have for your primary? How are you dressing it up? How are you going backside? How do you get an RPO, a play action? Like everything you have should have those five answers, right? And it should be layered and layered and layered. So it doesn't matter what the defense gives you, your offense can pull it off. And it doesn't matter what offense they run. You probably should have done that in the beginning anyway. If it's a, I tell you, you know, I run the four two five, and we struggle in midfield with a double tight end look, unless we just know going in and we've had time to practice. But if someone breaks that open on us, it does make our rules a little wonky. But we have an answer for it. Like, it is there. Maybe we just have to go over on a whiteboard again to remind the kids or whatever. But um, flavor of the week is not good on offense, defense, or special teams. And I tell you what, hearing you talk about just pooch kick and onside kick, you're warming my heart. I'm an onside kick every time guy. I, that's that's going to be in every coaching packet I ever put together. I'm going to get us 10% more <laughs> offensive series because we are onside kicking the crap out of that thing. But uh, anyway, yes. So we'll move on to the next question. And, that's, and, and you talk about delegation a little bit. So we'll just kind of, I guess, dig in there. So at, um, how much is your staff involved in your, in your overall game plan? Well, a ton, you know, if you don't involve them, I mean, what's the point of having a staff? And so, you know, we're going to define roles. Uh, so obviously each position would grade their own kids when they're breaking down our film and they're going to grade the kids they're going against. So, you know, we try, we try to work the different ways we do things and grade is an optimal word. There's a lot of ways you can grade. Basically what I'm asking our guys to do is give me a report on what our kids are doing well and what they're not doing well and if we need to fire any of them, I mean, that's kind of, are they doing so bad? We've got a guy that can step in. If the answer is no, then it doesn't matter if they have a 48 on their grade because the next guy's not ready. So right. now I want to know what, what can we do to improve our own kid? And the same thing when we're, when we're looking at an opponent, don't tell me this kid's a, you know, he graded at 88 or so. I don't know what that means. Like, just tell me, you know, is this kid going to be problems for us or is this kid a kid we can take advantage of? So, Every position coach is going to do that on who they're going against. Okay. Then they have other things that we delegate to them. So like um, our special teams coach obviously is working special teams and I'll usually have a helper with him that might have him help, help chart different things. Um, I have my offensive line coach. Part of his job will be to do like our red zone plays that we want to run, you know, because so, he's, that's what he's looking at is their box and what that looks like. You know, my quarterback coach, he might be worried what kind of third and long, fourth and long plays that are we wanting to, we think are going to be good plays for us that week. So offensively, you kind of have a certain segment of the game plan that you're working on. So not just watch your team, watch their team. My guy who's going to be looking at their coverages is coming up with our third and fourth down long plays. And then my guy who's looking at their front is coming up with our red zone package. So, and we do the same thing on defense. You know, the defensive coordinator is in charge of all of it, but his linebacker coach a lot of times will be breaking down their box and different blitzes that we want to, we have them already, but different blitzes that we want to highlight that week. 
And then he's looking at the back end of, okay, what kind of coverages do we prefer this week against this team? So you're mixing and matching what they're already kind of looking at and allowing them to have a say in the game plan. And then just because the guy said it doesn't mean I don't have ultimate veto power, but 99.9% of the time, what they say I'm going to trust because they're spending a lot of time working on that. So not only do you want your guy, you know, grading their kid, but you want them involved in the game plan. And then there are the, what I call like the crappy jobs of breakdown, like ODK, you know, first and 10, all that kind of stuff. That stuff's horrible. So we try to divide that out. We might do it game by game. We might have one coach does all ODK and one guy does all first and 10 and one guy does all run pass or all that stuff that's got to go into your report. We try to divide and conquer that. Uh, usually I'll put that with the younger coaches. It's a lot of my older coaches, mainly coordinators, are going to be working more heavy in the game plan. So I need the younger coaches kind of doing that work. Uh, and then as you work your way up, then you kind of get out of that a little bit. Uh, and, and then you've got to trust that you've taught them what you expect them to look for. So a lot of times as a coach, we need to practice this now, like practice it during the spring, practice it during the summer, practice it when there's low pressure. Pull out a game, break down your week zero opponent. Go ahead and break them down off of an old film you have. I know you're probably going to throw it away anyway, but now you've practiced as a coaching staff going through breaking down a film with low pressure. Then you can sit in there and talk about, hey, you know, next time I prefer you did this, or next time make sure you add why instead of being pissed on Sunday that the guy didn't do that or ignoring it and just kind of going, I guess it didn't matter, and just moving on. There's only one or two options you have Sunday night at 9 is get really mad and make everybody, the whole staff, stay up there really late or just let it go. But if you do it now, uh, then you can correct and and teach what you want. Most coaches are not, they're not there to like do a bad job. You just have to kind of explain to them what you wanted by what you're asking them to do. Um, so that's kind of the major things I kind of look for is every coach has their own position. Of course, every coach has uh, breakdowns of the opponent, which could include good and bad things. And then there are, we want to make sure that our coaches know exactly what their role is and what's expected of them. You know, coach, you talked about um, scout self scouting your kids to see if there's anybody you need to fire or what do we need help on? And that, I think that goes with scheme as well, or, or play, right? If, if we're not good at power, or inside zone, or a certain pass scheme, we or a uh, um, concept. We need to talk about that because we may have to throw it out of the playbook and find another answer, right? If you're, uh, you know, a lot of people have gotten into duo recently. If you're not doing well with duo, you need to find another inside to mid zone run game, okay? And and it's okay to do that, but like you said, get used to it now so that reinstalling that on Mondays is, is not quite as bad. Um, it is important to know when it's time to kind of cut the cord and let, let that thing go, right? Like we've tried for three weeks. We've wasted 40 reps a week at practice to try to get duo in and we just can't get it. it we wasted the time, but why would we waste another two or three weeks of reps trying to do the same thing? Um, I really like what you talked about letting different coaches, um, talk about doing the red zone package and the third down and long package. I even would go as far as to like my O-line coach is is when I get there and I have an, my O-line coach is probably going to be the run game. Like he's going to identify the box and figure out where we're going to do good in the run game. If it's telling him to find the bubble, if it's t- whatever, a, a kid that we need to kick out or trap because I don't want to try to go head up with that cat, whatever it is. Um, and And the same for like almost like a passing game coordinator whoever's checking out their coverage and knows the percentages and when they like to do what that cat's probably the one that's going to help identify what passing concepts are going in that week or, or carrying into that game plan. Um, you talked about another one there at the end and now I forgot because you're good. Well, I was going to say a lot of times when you're, when you're talking about that is as your staff grows and you become more comfortable and they become more competent. And I don't mean that in an ugly way. I mean, we all have to learn. We all right. start somewhere, but they don't know until they know. Right. Correct. And so like, I'm blessed to be on a staff with a lot of guys I've been on staff with for almost nine years. Well, I didn't let my run, my offensive line coach when he was a brand new coach design our red zone game plan. Like, <laughs> right. that, didn't, that didn't happen. You're probably year one through five. 
you know, but as we've talked and learned and bounced ideas and he knows me and I know him, now he's had the freedom to do that kind of stuff. And so uh, the same thing on defense, you know, I think, I think defensively, a lot of times you have a guy who's just breaking down scheme and stuff, and he's not really identifying players. Kind of going back to the first segment we had where your defensive line coach, you know, we've done this several times where we have one dominant defensive lineman or a 314, and we find their worst lineman and he's really bad. Well, guess where our best guy is going to line up yeah. on that guy because he's really good anyway, and that guy will never block him. And now this guy, and that, and that, so that, that kind of stuff, our defensive line guy is going to catch and then suggest it up the ladder. And then now that can be implemented in the game plan. I'll tell you another um, idea, or we talked about given uh, their roles, responsibilities, or whatever, timeline is huge on that. You have to set a timeline. And especially if right now you're listening, you're a young coordinator. Um, I can tell you my, I guess technically my second year as a coordinator, but my first one when I wasn't just doing installing what the head coach wanted. I struggled to get all of the staff coaches to have things done on, you talk about like breaking down film. Yeah. I'm st it's Wednesday and I'm waiting for, you know, all the third down plays or, or whatever it was. And a lot of that was just a lot of disrespect and you have to be careful if you're young about a coach who's been at it a long time, just disrespecting you. Maybe it's a conversation to have, but looking back, I'm, I don't know that I ever went over a timeline. Like, Hey guys, this all needs to be done Sunday night. So, you know, just having a timeline so they know how they can, from Friday when the whistle blows for the end of the fourth quarter or overtime, whatever, until you're going to have that meeting, they know what they need. They can kind of backwards plan and get that stuff done. Because I've been there too, right? Sometimes you just get pressed for time and family takes over and you don't get stuff done. But give them that guideline so they can uh, they can get it done on, on their time. Um, so now that we talked about weekends and the game ends and now we need to have a meeting on Sunday, so what does the design for your weekend look like, Coach? I'm a big fan. I don't think that football should be a seven day a week job. Like I don't really believe that, especially at the high school level. I don't think it should be that way at any level. And it was good to hear uh, Deion Sanders come out and, and pretty much say the same thing that, uh, you know, basically we're dads and there are guys that are doctors and lawyers that lives are at stake and they work five days a week. Yet we coach a sport and we think we're so almighty. We got to coach seven days a week, you know? And so it was good to hear him say that because I believed in that for a long time. Uh, so a couple of things that we do is what can be done at home is done at home. And I think I'd been doing this before, but COVID, I think, brought to light for a lot of people how much work you could do at home. You're talking about ODK. You don't have to come up to the field house to ODK an opponent. You don't have to come up to the field house to break down their red zone defense. You can do that at home. Some guys like to come up to the field house and, you know what, good for you. Come up there and enjoy the quiet. Some guys would rather be at home with you know something on the background and their earbuds in or whatever it is airpods i guess i'm getting old there but whatever they're listening to, that's how they work and that's fine and so whatever can be done at home is done at home you hit the nail on the head there is a timeline where this is expected to be done and the punishment for me is i'm going to bring every one of these coaches up on the weekend if you screw this up and it's pretty much stated to every coach like if you guys all do your job this is how things are going to work if we show up here Sunday at six o'clock, that's when we meet and somebody has not done their job, you screwed the pooch for everybody. And we're up here Sunday now at one o'clock to make sure that everybody does their job. And so you have to kind of set those rigid guidelines, but nobody wants to be that guy. Like nobody wants to be that guy. Right. So what can be done at home is done at home. You know, we don't come up till Sunday. And then on top of that, as a head coach, only call meetings that directly impact the guy in the meeting. Like I don't need my entire staff to be sitting there for our offensive staff meeting. That doesn't have to happen. So the way I do it is I section off times. I'm up there basically from right around after lunch, so one o'clock ish till the, till we're done. But my coaches can choose to come up there if they want to and do their own meetings, but I'm going to meet with, my special teams coordinator at one o'clock on Sunday. And we're going to meet at one. I'm going to meet with a trainer at one 30, talk about injuries. I'm going to meet with my off, my team's coordinator at two. Uh, and there are things that I'm expecting in these meetings. Like there's certain things I want you to already have done by the time we do this. I'm going to meet with my offensive coordinator and staff at three o'clock. And then we're going to meet as a staff at six. So if you did all your work at home, 
and your defensive coordinator isn't asking you to come up to meet with the whole staff, you don't have to be there till six. But if, if like a lot of times our DC, they'll kind of set up their own little meeting at two o'clock. That's on them. That's they can do that. Or, they, or sometimes they'll meet on Saturday because that's better. So then they don't have to come up to Sunday till six o'clock. So I think if you do that as a head coach, you don't have these meetings with 10 guys where two guys are working, you know, and that's kind of what you're trying to avoid is there are things as a head coach, you have to do all of it. You have to be up there. It just has to happen. There's no way around that, but it, it makes zero sense to have every single coach be punished because you have to be up there. Uh, and so that's kind of a, the second thing I'd hit. Third thing is that last meeting. So we meet at like, I think it's six o'clock or seven. I can't remember which time. We, we're going to keep that meeting under two hours because that meeting is only information that needs to be told to everybody. There are a few things that we always do. We always share about our position. So we always share about results from Friday's game so everybody can hear how everybody's position is doing, mainly because if some coach is thinking about making a personnel change, another position might want to grab that kid. So there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. Special teams, I think, needs to be shared for the whole staff to hear. And then as a head coach, uh, I'll go through kind of the general guideline of what we've decided we're doing defensively and offensively. And then you go through logistical things the last half of the meeting, like, hey, guys, our team theme this week is this. Coach so-and-so's in charge. Coach, what you got planned for us? We have a JV game on Monday night. Friday night is, you know, whatever theme night it's going to be. we got to leave at 4 o'clock. We're going to eat wherever. Those are things that everybody's got to kind of be aware of. We'll usually vote for players of the game uh, for that week. Uh, and then that's kind of those, that's the meeting that everybody's got to be a part of. Uh, but if you've done all your work on the front end, there's zero reason that meeting lasts more than two hours, in my opinion. No, I agree. hundred percent. Um, talk about what you can do, get done, do it at home. And, and I, look, I, maybe it's the youth in me. I'm 35 years old, so I'm not that youthful, but I, despise Saturday meetings. I think the science is no longer there. The, you know, we need to get these kids in and lift on Saturday. Like, what is that day going to hurt to miss? Did you lift Monday through Thursday? Because they probably need some rest. And there's, you know, there's a lot of science coming out saying you should lift game day, like within an hour of the game. You should have a light. Um, we call it a central nervous system pump or whatever you want to call it, right? Get their body ready to go right before it needs to be get ready to go on that first kickoff. So, Obviously, away games, it's a little harder, but uh, but you can get it done. So missing Saturday is not going to kill the kids. If there's someone that needs, a lot of coaches use this excuse, you know, well, what if somebody's hurt? They, I need them to come in so I can check them. Cool. Have that kid come in, right? Stay late Friday and talk to them and see what's going on. Um, my wife is, is huge into, uh, she's a physical therapist, obviously. She's into this um, rehabbing football injuries. And because I'm a coach, she's our sideline coverage now. So it's, that's been wonderful. Because she can tell us when the at the end of the game what's going on with each player, right? Who was hurt? How severe was it? What actions were taken? Um, by the way, since I've on the the case or the topic, stop using rice, right? That used to be what was it like? Right, I think it was rest, rest ice, ice, compression, compression, elevation. and then yes. So we're not doing that anymore. Look up um, peace and love, and it sounds crazy, but look up peace and love injury rehab and that's like a 24 hour to eight week plan or whatever so obviously you need to go see somebody that's a professional stop putting ice on your players injuries no uh NSAIDs no anti-inflammatory no ice no more it's gone the guy that wrote rice even admitted I screwed up it's not real stop putting ice on injuries anyway um so if you have somebody that needs to be treated meet them or send them to a professional they don't need to come see the head football coach for an injury when they can go see a physical therapist. And I know a lot of physical therapists are opening their offices on Saturday morning mm -hmm. and helping kids for free, at least doing an eval for free. Like that's, that's pretty common practice that was going on back when I was playing in the early 2000s. So if, if you don't know, and you probably don't know because you're probably not a medical professional, use them and have a conversation with your local medical professional that says, we're not sending them up here to get a two weeks out of football slip every time they come. Cause I know that's the concern, right? Call my hey, wife. She'll tell you. While we're here, Daniel, did, has your wife opened her, uh, her? Oh, we have. So, um, Northwest Arkansas, Northeast Oklahoma, we are serving you now. Adaptable, excuse me, adaptable physical therapy. We're in Grove, Oklahoma. Um, they're just like right downtown at the T. Stop at the red light. We're just touched to the east. 
Um, my wife has had her first couple patients this week. So our soft opening was last Monday. So at the time of this episode, I don't know what day it comes out. But, uh, May the 4th, we picked, uh, well, I say we, my wife, because she's this cool. She picked um, Star Wars Day to be our, Wars, our yeah. official opening. That's our grand opening. So we're cutting the tape and everything. So if you're in Northwest Arkansas or uh, Northeast Oklahoma, send your kids in. It is free on Saturday mornings. We just need to call the night before to let us know. Um, and we will see you do an eval for free for your kids. She's also concussion certified. So there's a lot of new science in concussion. It's no longer lay in your dark room for a week. It's, um, it's get back out there tomorrow. We want you out getting the sun in your eyes. Um, a little bit of like headache is okay. We don't, they don't want you to not have any symptoms. That's crazy talk. You just had a concussion. The biggest things is we're a little bit of movement and we're not getting back to impact essentially. So hit up my wife. Um, you can find her on Twitter at adaptable PT. And then uh, you can just email me or text me or whatever if you want. But thank you for letting me put that plug in there. <laughs> gotcha. Um, anyway, I had just go back to Saturdays. I hate using Saturdays. Let me wake up with my family when my kids allow me and eat my biscuits and gravy and spend the day doing family chores and we can do football on Sunday. I'm going to get my part done on film anyway, probably by Saturday at four or five. Like most coaches can do that on their own. So mm -hmm. I just completely back up what you said about if it can be done at home, let it be done at home and meet on Sundays. You can watch football together as a staff. My wife doesn't like football anyway, so. Yeah, well, I, a side note there, too, a lot of coaches, if you have the ability, Saturday is generally youth football, and I know that whatever your thoughts are on that, you need to show your face. So you know, we, I try to ask all my coaches for a home Saturday game. Don't have to come to all of them, but let's pick one and make sure that at every home game, one of us is out there showing our face, being around the kids. Um, you know, I think it's important. Well, we kind of plugged through that pretty quick, man. About like how I ate that dinner earlier. So <laughs> we're going to move on to the last part here. It's everybody's favorite by this point, probably. And that's what not to do as a coach, our lessons learned uh, segment here. Um, so can you tell us about today's lesson, coach? Yeah, so today's lesson of what not to do as a coach uh, is think that more hours at the field house equals that you're working harder than everybody else. Kind of laying into what we've been talking about here. There's this old coach across uh, – uh, across town uh, a while back. I'm not going to name names, but uh, they believe that people should drive by the field house and see cars there because they're concerned about what the public would think about coaches working on Saturday. I call bull crap on that. Like, I think that's about the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard. Like to me, coaches are going to work hard. And if we lose or win and you want to fire us because we lose or win, go for it. You know, but yep. let's not think that our cars being parked at the field house mean that we're working or if our car is not parked there, that we're not working. You know, to me, as a coach, it takes more effort to be organized and efficient than it does to be lazy on the front end and have to cram during the season. And I think that's a lot of times what happens is you work long hours because you didn't dedicate the hours up front to organizing what you're doing. So I think a lot of times we sometimes misjudge organized people that are efficient with laziness, which is not at all the case. And I think it, too many times as coaches, we like to use the word grind or work 90 hours a week at the field house, or I slept at the field house. Shame on you. Go home to your family. I mean, my, my goodness gracious, you know, that's uh, enough of that stuff. You know, we need to make sure we're working efficient. We're doing our job. We're caring for our kids. But if that's all you're about, man, that's a miserable life, and I don't want any part of that. You know, they say about those coaches is they don't want to go home. It's it's usually their home life, right? That's they they feel better and more organized and and mentally at peace at the field house, and that's fine if that's you. But please don't drag your whole staff into it. Like, right. Lord have mercy. All right, coach. So before we get out of here, can you uh, once again just remind us how we can simplify football so that we can make our staff and players more productive. Sure. Yeah. Coaching 101 podcast is sponsored by Find Away Productions. Find Away Production, real quick plug here, is also done graphically by J Simp Designs, which is my wife. So if you like the graphic behind me, if you're watching YouTube or basically any book I've ever produced, that's my wife. And she does all kinds of graphics for actually throw it deep publishing. She does theirs and a couple other people as well. But Find Away Productions uh, hosts offensive coordinator academy.com. Uh, which, of course, has all things offense from the full academy uh, to workbooks to templates to single courses. 
anything offense, you can go over to offensivecoordinatoracademy.com and find defensivecoordinatoracademy.com is going to host multiple things defensive, including the brand new defensive line uh, coach academy. And it also hosts the defensive coordinator academy as well as several smaller products and workbooks and different tools you can use. And finally, fbcoachsimpson.com, uh, which is the host of Headsets, the magazine, which is free, the Gun T Offense. Uh, the whole system is on there. So a lot of guys ask about where to go find this. If you go to that website, you'll find everything you want, Gun T or 3 4 Swarm, up to 29 books we just mentioned, and about 50 or so coaching materials. Uh, so there's free stuff on the website, small chunk money on the website, and then, of course, larger purchases if you're interested in that. Awesome. Um, where are you at on social media, Coach? How can we get a hold of you if I want to talk about headsets? Sure. Uh, you can reach out to me, all things FB Coach Simpson. So FB Coach Simpson at gmail.com. You can reach out to me on Twitter, FB Coach Simpson. You can find me in all the Facebook groups. We have a group for the Offensive Coordinator Academy, Defense Coordinator Academy. I feel like we got a zillion groups. You have the Shotgun Wing T group as well. Uh, so any flavor of social media you want to be on, reach out. Always looking for writers. And then uh, I know Daniel and I are, are going to be looking for guests as well. So if you have an interest coming on the podcast, sharing some knowledge with coaches, you know, we're always interested in talking to coaches. Awesome. You can find me on Twitter at Coach Chambo OK. I've had a few people reaching out. Um, it's been pretty wonderful. So keep doing that, guys. And then also um, you can email me at ChamberlainFootballConsulting at gmail.com. That's Wilt the Stilt, essentially his last name. Google it. That's how you spell it. Um, put it before football consulting at gmail.com and you can get to me. The podcast is at coaching one Oh one pod. Apparently at one Oh one podcast is too long. Thank you, Twitter, but it's okay. I don't call them pods. Some people do. Uh, I'm trying to think coach Vass. He's, you know, he always calls it the pod. Uh, it's weird to me, but that's where we're at now. So at coaching one Oh one pod, we want to thank you for being a listener of the coaching one Oh one podcast. We hope you'll join us next week as we continue to make the complex more simple. Please consider subscribing to the show so you'll always know when the new episodes are out. We'll leave you with this. It's hard to beat someone who never gives up. No matter the situation, find a way.